I want to start by making a confession that I've actually never made before to a crowd. And that is that last year I published this book that Jason mentioned, Hooked, How to Build Habit-Forming Products. And it's a book about how the technologies that we use hook us. Specifically, these tech products like our iPhones and Facebook and email that keep us checking. And so here's my confession. Very soon after writing this book, something unfortunate happened. I found myself hooked to these technologies. First, my professional life suffered. I couldn't focus on doing the kind of important, concentrated work I needed to do. And then my personal life suffered. I found I couldn't be fully present with the people in my life that I care about most. And my wife and my six-year-old daughter started paying the price. So I have to admit to you that I was not in full control of my behavior. Now that that's off my chest, that's my confession, I want to know if I'm alone. Let me ask you a few questions. First, has anyone else here found that they've stayed online longer than they've intended? Okay. How about this one? Have you ever made unsuccessful attempts to moderate your internet use? All right. Let me see if this one rings a bell. Have you ever concealed the extent of your involvement with the internet? All right, very good. Well, I'm glad to know I'm not alone. And that these questions that I just asked you were actually adapted from a diagnostic tool to assess internet addiction. And no, just because you raised your hand, that doesn't mean you're an internet addict. But it does raise an interesting point. That many of us will act against our better interests at the hands of these gadgets. Why? What is going on? How did we get here? And most importantly, what do we do about it? Well, you should take some comfort in knowing that this is not a new problem. That in fact, Aristotle and Socrates talked about the nature of acrasia, this tendency that people have to do things against their better judgment. It's actually nothing new. These chains that hold us back from doing what we know we should be doing. The word akrasia comes from the Greek a meaning without and kratos meaning power, without power. And yet, we do have power, don't we? It's just that these technologies have evolved so much faster than we have, right? As Salim just pointed out, we can't keep up. Our social, our personal habits change slowly while these technologies advanced ever more rapidly. As Paul Graham says, we haven't developed the time to create the social antibodies to protect us from overusing these technologies. So, to be fair though, this might be the very definition of a first world problem, right? These free apps are so good that we want to use them all the time, right? That's like the greatest injustice ever, right? Well, to to be clear, to put this in perspective, I'm no Luddite. I agree with Salim that these technologies have done unbelievable good for humanity. We're more connected and we can do more things than we ever could before, and that's terrific. But somehow these technologies seep into areas of our life where they don't belong. And any time technology prevents us from living the kind of lives we want to live, something has to be done. So the solution here isn't to get rid of our technology wholesale. It's not to try and somehow unwind the clocks of progress. That's not going to happen. The solution is to try and figure out ways to put technology in its place. So I want to share with you some very practical, actionable tips that I've used to moderate my own technology habits. But to do that, we first have to understand how technology hooks us in the first place. And here's how it technology does it. It's called the hook. Every habit-forming product has this hook. This is the backbone of my research and my book that I spent two and a half years writing. This four-step process that through successive cycles through these hooks, this is how our habits are formed. Every hook starts with a cue. A cue prompts the action, prompts the habit. We have our external triggers, that prompt us to action by giving us some piece of information in the trigger itself. A call to action like click here, buy now, or play this, all are external triggers. The information is in the trigger itself. 
We also have these internal triggers where the information for what to do next is stored as a memory or an association in the user's mind. So what we do when we're in a particular situation, a routine around certain people in a particular place, and most frequently when we experience certain emotions, dictates what we do next with little or no conscious thought. So what do we do about these triggers? How do we break some of these unwanted behaviors, these unwanted habits, by removing these triggers in our life? Well, let me ask you a question. How many of you enjoy sleep and wish you could get more of it? Okay. How many of you enjoy sex and wish you could get more of it? All right. Almost everybody. Well, I've got a solution for you to help you with both of those things, and that is to remove the internet from your bedroom. 75% of Americans sleep with their cell phone every night. Last thing they touch at, at night when they go to bed, first thing they reach for in the morning when they wake up. You will get to bed sooner, you will rest easier, and you will be less tempted to fondle your phone as opposed to the person next to you when you charge your devices outside. Next, we have to manage these notifications. Only 8% of, of smartphone users ever change their notification settings. This is something you can do very quickly, very easy, to make sure that you're triggered not on the app maker's schedule, but on your schedule. Next, let's go into the boardroom, into the workplace. I do a lot of consulting for companies trying to build habit-forming products, and invariably, every time I go into one of these meetings, I see this. Someone in the room, typically the highest paid person, thinks it's a good time to take out their device or start emailing on their computer in the middle of the meeting. And this seems pretty benign, but let me just take a second to illustrate why this is such a toxic thing to do. First, using your technology in a meeting sends a very clear message to everyone else that gadget time is more important than your time. Second, it stresses everybody else out because they know the boss is sending them email, meaning that they're going to get more work dumped on them soon. And finally, and perhaps worst of all, is what happens when that person who's been using technology in a meeting decides they'd like to rejoin the discussion. Because now they only have two bad choices. Number one, they can admit they have no idea what's been going on for the past 10 minutes because they've been on email, in which case they look like a doofus. Or what typically happens, and the worst outcome of all, they check out. So to avoid embarrassment and telling everybody, hey, I have no clue what's going on right now, they just shut down. So instead of having this person's contribution to the meeting, we essentially have a warm body sitting in a chair. So here's the solution. We need, when we're going to meet in the real world, if something is important enough to actually sit down together in the real world, we have to be present both in body and mind. We have to hang it up. And we do that by using these digital hat racks. Now, this is a poster I made that I, I was hoping people would hang up in conference rooms. Maybe you'll print this out and post this in, in your conference room as well. This is just an illustration. But these are real. We have real-life digital hat racks. They're called charging stations. So this 30-second search on Amazon revealed all these charging stations, which I think should be a fixture in every meeting room. Next. To avoid these unwanted triggers in our life, we have to make sure that we make focus a corporate policy. Several leading-edge companies are experimenting with turning off certain triggers like email during certain parts of the day to give employees the time to focus, to solve difficult problems. Companies like Boston Consulting Group, Daimler, Intel are finding they can actually boost worker creativity and productivity by sheltering them at least a few hours a day from all these triggers that come from email. The next step of the hook is the action phase. The action phase is defined as the simplest behavior done in anticipation of a reward. Okay? The simplest behavior done in anticipation of reward. It can be something as simple as opening an app, or scrolling through a feed like on Pinterest, or pushing the play button on YouTube. These very simple actions done in anticipation of reward. And what product makers have found, a large part because of my advice, is that the easier we can make something to do, the more likely we are to do it. So what do we do? How do we break these unwanted behaviors, these bad habits, 
knowing about the power of these actions, these simple to do actions? Well, it starts from making the unintended behavior a little bit harder to do. You'd be shocked how these small things, making a behavior just a little bit more difficult to do, can greatly change the outcome, greatly change how likely you are to do that behavior. Something as simple as burying an app icon a few screens deep so that you have to tap or swipe a few more times, or logging out of distracting apps between use, or using Gmail through your browser as opposed to using the app all make a big difference in your likelihood of doing these unintended behaviors. One thing that, I, that I'm a big advocate of is using what I call attention retention tools. There's an explosion of companies today who are designing new technologies to help us focus. Products like Forest and Freedom reward users for focus time and turn off the internet during certain times of the day so we can actually think. One solution I have in my house, which is very cheap, is this $10 outlet timer that every night at 10 p.m. shuts off my internet router automatically. The goal here is to make the unwanted behavior just a little bit more difficult to do so that we can insert some mindfulness to ask ourselves, do we really want to be doing this behavior right now, as opposed to using these products mindlessly. Next comes the reward phase of the hook. Companies reward users, give them what they want in these product interactions, but it's not just any old reward, it's a variable reward. Many of you might be familiar with the work of B.F. Skinner, the father of operant conditioning. He found that when he provided a reward, a little food pellet, to these pigeons on a variable schedule, meaning sometimes the pigeon would peck at the disc, nothing would come out, no reward, and then the next time they would push the, the, uh, the, the, the disc and they would receive a reward, when that reward was given on a variable schedule of reinforcement, the number of responses, the number of times these pigeons pecked at this disc increased. It was observed to occur more frequently when the reward was given on a variable schedule of reinforcement. It's exactly the same psychology that keeps us, check, keeps us pulling on a slot machine. It's what makes gambling so intoxicating. And it's the same psychology that works on us online. Scrolling through that newsfeed, searching and searching for that cool next reward is exactly the same psychology of what gets us to pull on a slot machine. They're both variable rewards. So what do we do about this? How do we manage distraction by understanding and breaking these hooks? Well, we can save the reward for later. Let me know if this has ever happened to you. You go online to read an article, it's going to take you about five minutes, and then somehow you look at the clock and 30 minutes or an hour has passed, because, but even though you only wanted to read one quick article, right? Has that happened to anybody? All right, almost everybody, right? This time-wasting vortex. Well, what you can do is use a simple tool like Pocket to not read online and instead send that variable reward, send the content over to this app called Pocket that you can access on your schedule, on your time. Finally, the last step of the hook is the investment phase. The investment is something that increases the likelihood of the next pass through the hook. Apps use these investments, technologies use these investments to load the next trigger. So for example, when I send someone a message on WhatsApp, I'm loading the next trigger because I'm likely to get a reply. And that reply is an external trigger prompting me to check the technology again, to use the product and pass through these four steps of the hook once again. So what do we do? Well, here's a tip, here's an actionable tip you can write down. Slow the next trigger. You know, there's no rule that says that every email we write needs to be delivered right away. So you can use a tool like Boomerang or Follow Up CC to put some delay between when you send the message and when it's delivered two days, four days, a few hours later, so we stop playing this endless email ping pong back and forth by not loading the next trigger quite so quickly. And finally, know the investment. You know, when we walk into a grocery store and we look at the price of something, we know exactly how much that's gonna cost us in terms of dollars and cents. But when it comes to the products we use online, that's not the case. We almost never know how much something is going to cost in terms of our time investment. Listen, there's a reason we call it paying attention. Just because something is free to use doesn't mean it doesn't come with a cost. 
So be very careful about using these products with no end in sight, in particular when the business models of these companies depends on monetizing your time and your attention. Look, these companies are built to be engaging. It's no accident that we keep checking these devices. It's by design. I know, I wrote the book. These companies understand what makes you tick and what makes you click better than you do. But there's an upside. The good news is that although these companies are becoming more difficult to put down, they're also becoming better. And I believe if we're smart, we can separate the costs from the benefits. Because as Sophocles reminds us, nothing vast enters the life of mortals without a curse. The internet is indeed something vast. And yet, it comes with a curse. And that curse is this constant distraction, this additional tool we have to distract us from our better judgments. But that doesn't mean we can't do something about it. I hope that you'll use some of the techniques that I've shared with you that have helped me moderate my own technology use and share feedback with me around what's working for you. But to be totally transparent, I still struggle with how much I use technology, and I'm afraid I always will. Because as Aristotle and Socrates remind us, distraction is an age-old problem, but that gives me hope. Because if humanity has continued to progress despite this curse of distraction, that means that together we can put technology in its place. By understanding our deeper habits that drive us to use these products, we understand ourselves and we'll be able to do our best work and live our best lives. Because now you know how these products work and you'll be able to identify these four steps of the hook wherever you see them and finally be able to control technology as opposed to allowing technology to control you. Thank you very much.